Jim Richards, and you have just walked through the doors of Impact Cyber Church, and we are here to adore God through His Word. You know something? Man, I love praise and worship. Don't get me wrong. I was just talking to a minister friend of mine today, and she was telling me about how her husband loves the praise and worship in a service, and she loves the truth and, and getting the Word of God, you know? And I said, well, I'm schizophrenic because I love both of them, man. I, I, love, I love deep, true, intimate worship. I love celebrating before God, and I love the Word of God. But you know something? Praise and worship is a lot about what goes in, in your heart. And as you take the Word into your life, or into your heart. And, it, and if it's your intention to put this into practice in your life, and you're seeing the ways that the Word of God can make your life go better because it makes you understand God. It makes you recognize what the truth is and make you understand how to walk, you know, this walk with God, then that will turn into praise and worship. That will turn into gratitude. That will turn into worship. So, you know, man, when we're going through these, when we're going through these messages, you may have times you just have to put the, hit the pause button there and just take you a little praise and worship break. And because you may see some nugget that you realize, I see where and how I can put this to work in my life. And God will just breathe that into you. He'll do it beyond what I'm saying. He'll do it beyond what I can do. He will do it in ways that I can't explain it to you. And I absolutely can't show it to you. But I'll tell you what, God can show it to you. Open up your heart. Every time you hear the word, whether you're listening to me preach or going to church, or wherever, you always open up your heart. And it's like, Holy Spirit, you're the teacher. So regardless of what this man says, I want to hear what you've got to say to me. And you know what's amazing is so many times people will experience something that's a spinoff from what I say or from what somebody else says. It really has nothing to do with what that person's saying, but for some reason, man, it just triggers something in you that opens your heart up to God. And you know what? When that happens, that's when you, that's when you, that's when you, that's when you stop. That's the great thing about cyber church. You can hit the pause button and you can say, you know, I don't have to listen to anything else until I'm ready to. I can just meditate on this. I can ponder on this. I can connect to this. I can pray this through. I can worship this through. I can express my gratitude for God. You know, it, it can just turn into whatever your heart will let it turn into. You know, today we're talking about just one of my favorite subjects, which is the subject of peace. We're talking about the path of peace. Now, <clears throat> I've said this for 30 years, I guess, and that is this. I used to say it this way. Peace is the language of the Holy Spirit. Well, and I knew that was inaccurate, but it was the best way I knew to say it at the time. But let me, let me say it this way now, which I think is more accurate. Peace is the environment wherein we can hear the Holy Spirit speak. Man, I want to tell you something. You know, when I was a little boy, we used to go down to the creek behind my house and and, uh, uh, and, you know, we'd fish in that creek and, you know, we would jump in the creek and catch crawfish. And some of you know what crawfish are. We call them crawdads. And, uh, if you're a little redneck kid out in the country, we catch these crawfish, break the tail off them, use that for fish bait. And we'd go fishing. And, and after we caught us a stringer full of fish to take home and cook, we'd, we'd go down to a big old wide place where the, where the creek spread out and it, was a, and it fed a big pond there. And we'd go swimming there in that pond. I mean, it was just, it was just the place that we celebrated. And I used to just be amazed when I, was a, when I was a little kid. I'd stand up there on the banks of that little pond, and, and I, I loved throwing rocks in and watch when they hit and watch all of the rings that, that would come out that would emit from where this little rock would, would hit this pond, and these little circles would come out and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, <clears throat> for, for some reason, in my mind, that always represented eternity, something that just seemed to never end. It just seemed to go on and on and on and on. Well, you fast forward, you know, 30 or 40 years, and I was standing on the shores of a, a Destin Beach in Florida, and I was watching these waves crash in, and, and I love going to the beach. I just love that environment. I love the sun. I love the salt water. I love the warm air. It's just something that Brenda and I have always just enjoyed doing together. It's a great retreat. Many times when I get down to, to where I've written a book and I'm ready to finish it up, uh, I used to go to the beach and we'd stay for a week and, and I'd get up and ride in the mornings and then we would relax and play and refresh my brain uh, in the afternoons and the evening and I'd be ready to write the next morning and I'd, you know, I'd finish up a book while I was there. Just, it's just a great creative environment for me. But on this particular occasion, I was standing there looking out on the beach and I, boy, the, the, the waves were tumbling in. And, and I picked up something, a big seashell, biggest thing I could find, tossed it out in those waves. Uh, because I was standing there thinking about the ripples 
that would form on this pond when I was a little boy that would just spread out and, and how, that, how that you could just toss this tiny, tiny little pebble into this smooth pond. And no matter how tiny it was, you could recognize that there was a disturbance. And man, I, I would throw the biggest shells I could find into that ocean. And you know what? It would hit that turbulent water and you could never tell that there was a disturbance. And I'll never forget the Holy Spirit speaking to me there that day standing on that beach. And he said, when your heart is at peace, he said, it's like that pond. When your heart is at peace, it's, it's, it's as smooth as silk, like that water on that pond. And the smallest little disturbance you will recognize. And when you recognize that disturbance, you can immediately right there before it takes root in your, in your heart, before it takes root in your thoughts or your emotions, before it starts to take you down a path and affect the way you make decisions, you can immediately deal with that disturbance. And, and, and you know, what? I would find that if I spent time with the Lord every day, that I would catch sickness right in the very first stages and could bring an end to it. I would, I would, recognize bad decisions. I would have a sense about things that were coming because as long as I stayed at peace, I would recognize the slightest disturbance. But he said, he said, but if you're troubled, then your heart's like the waves uh, uh, that are crashing into this shore. He said, you could throw a concrete block into these waves and you would never even realize there was, there was a disturbance because it was already so turbulent. You know something? That's the way most of us live our lives. Most of us live our lives in an incredibly turbulent manner. Most of us are, are so stressed out most of the time that the truth is we don't recognize when God's trying to speak to us. We don't recognize when, when our peace is being robbed. We don't recognize when things are going wrong. And, and I'll tell you something, if we don't live in peace, over and over and over again, we will be surprised by the things that happen. Let me tell you something. If you're constantly surprised when things go wrong, if you're overtaken before you recognize that you're in a trap, a bad business deal, a bad relationship, a bad decision, if you're overwhelmed by the time that that happens, then very probably when you made that decision, you were not really and truly in peace. And you didn't recognize the turbulence that was taking place inside you. You didn't recognize and realize the voice of God that was trying to lead you in another way. Well, I want to tell you something. I want to teach you how to walk in the path of peace. As a matter of fact, let me just mention this because this will be the last time I'll have an opportunity to tell you about this before it happens. October the 20th through the 22nd, right here in Huntsville, Alabama, we're having a heart physics weekend. And we're going to be talking about, about overcoming stress with peace. Uh, I, I'm not sure, I'm not even sure what the title of it is really supposed to be other than the fact that we're going to teach you and give you tools about how to live in peace and how to deal with stress so that you sleep better, so you get in the morning, you got more energy, so that your thoughts are clear, so that you deal with negativity, pessimism, and all that sort of stuff. So I'm just going to tell you something. You want to, you, you want to be here. If you're, if you're trying to deal with this from a heart perspective, then you want to be for, here for Heart Physics Weekend, and, uh, and it's going to help you understand how to make this journey. All right, let's get back on this thing about peace. You know, peace is so incredibly uh, wonderful when we start understanding what it is. You know, you know peace is, is one of the primary factors in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, the word peace in the New Testament, the Greek word for peace, is almost identical to the Old, Old Testament word for peace, which is the word shalom. Now, the word peace, whether it's in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, it can mean, it can mean you know, a, a, a calm feeling, the, uh, uh, you know, the absence of fear, you know, residing and not, not being troubled and that sort of thing. But peace also has to do with uh, being blessed financially, with uh, being healthy, with being successful. As a matter of fact, when you begin to look in the New Testament at the word for peace, it could be the same word for healing. Actually, in the Old Testament, shalom is one of the words for healing. So you start realizing that, see, you can have peace that is based on a deception. You can have peace because you believe a lie. It's a false peace. The Bible, you know, warns against this. 
But the peace that God gives is a peace that is based on, it's a tranquility that is based on the fact that all of your needs are met in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if that's why the, the Apostle Paul over the book of Philemon, uh, I mean Philippians, after he talks about letting the peace of God rule in your heart, he talks about, now think on these things. Think on, you know, what's lovely, what's beautiful. You know, think on all of these good things. Why? So that you can experience the God of peace or the peace of God. Because you see, uh, uh, we, we, we need to have it in our mind. We need, our, our thoughts need to be saturated with the fact that in Christ, all of my needs are met. I don't have anything to be afraid of. Now, you may be sitting there saying, whoa, wait a minute. All my needs aren't met. I'm struggling right now. I can't pay my bills. I'm sick. I've got this going on. That, you know, that, all that may be true. But your healing has been paid for. Your prosperity has been paid for. Your joy has been paid for. Uh, everything that you need for life and godliness has been paid for through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's already been purchased. And so since it's been purchased for you, you, you know, Jesus qualifies you for it. If that becomes what you begin to focus on, it, and instead of you s stopping trying to get God to give you peace, you start acknowledging and trusting what you actually have from God, then peace is, gonna, is going to be the fruit of it. You know what's really interesting is peace is the fruit of righteousness. Now, now righteousness basically means as, as it should be, as things should be. And so when you realize that in Christ, everything is as it should be. Now, that doesn't mean everything goes wrong in your life is as it should be. That doesn't mean everything has a good purpose in your life. No, it means that Jesus has already paid for everything to be exactly as it should be according to all of his promises. And, and what we want to do then is, is we want to meditate on that, ponder on that, recognize that, accept that, and, and connect to it and lay hold to it. You know, the word receive means to, to take hold of something and, and bring it to yourself. So God wants us to live in a peace where we are confident in all the promises of God. You know, the Bible tells us that in the book of Peter, that is through the promises of God that we escape the corruption that's in the world through our desires. Now, there's nothing wrong with having desires, but if you've got desires that you don't realize are met in the Lord, then, then those desires will take you off course and you'll go try to find some unhealthy, some ungodly way to, to take hold of those, fulfill those desires. You know, the book of Romans, third chapter, it, it, it quotes from Isaiah, and I hate to read this thing. It's so long, it's so negative. It talks about, it talks about uh, 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 these, these people who don't seek after God, who have turned aside, uh, uh, who, who have, whose throat is an open tomb, and their tongues practice deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, and their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness, and their feet are swift to shed blood, and destruction is, and misery is in their way. Now listen to this. It says, and the way of peace they have not known. Now, <clears throat> there is a way or a path that will always lead us to peace. But like all the paths of God, see, God only walks in the path of righteousness. There is nothing crooked in any of the paths that He walks. There's no deceit. There is no death. There is no darkness. There is no dishonesty. And so, and so in his path, in the path of righteousness, a person lives in complete peace. Now, ultimately, we have peace with God because we believe that we have been made righteous through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate right there. See, the great struggle that nearly everybody fights with, the great religious battle is always about righteousness. You know, if you want to understand people who are fighting over righteousness, think about the word qualified. Because the word righteous, it really doesn't mean qualified, but the common concept or the idea is that, is that righteousness qualifies you for the blessings of God. <clears throat> if you go down here to, like, I went to a little denominational church that never one time in all the history of those ever prayed for the sick. Now, they believed it was the will of God to heal the sick. And, uh, and they, my pastor told me if God ever told him to pray for the sick, he would pray for the sick. 
And I said, well, what would you do if somebody asked you to pray for him? He said, then I'd have to pray first and see if it's the will of God to heal him. Well, let me tell you something, it's always the will of God for people to get healed. But just like people getting born again, the will of God doesn't always happen because, because we have to take hold of what God has given us by faith, which means we trust Him. We, we know His Word is true. It comes alive inside of our heart. And, and, and you know, some people have even turned faith into something negative, but, but, it, but it's not negative. But anyhow, you, you go three churches, three churches down from that church, and man, they gave an altar call every week, and they, they prayed for the sick to get healed. And you know what? You go to another church four or five blocks down the road, they prayed for the sick to get healed. Now, what would be interesting if you were to say, what would it take for a person to get healed? Nearly every one of these churches would have a list of different requirements. You see, basically those requirements would be the, really their standard of righteousness, their standard of what qualified you to receive the promises of God. And so, <clears throat> so when a person knows that they meet the requirements, when they know that they meet the qualifications for the promises of God, then that person is going to be at peace. They're not going to be striving. They're not going to be straining. They're not going to be trying to figure out some way to get God to love them enough to, to heal them. They're going to be at a complete place of peace, and they're going to be able to hear the voice of God as He leads them through whatever process they need to take to get healed, whether it's an instantaneous healing, whether it's a walk it out day by day healing, you know, whether it's some wisdom about what to do, what steps to take. But one way or another, the person who is at peace is, is going to be able to hear the voice of God. The person who is not at peace, the person who doesn't feel qualified, that person is always going to be striving and straining to become qualified. And they're going to be under so much stress. Honestly, they're never, ever, ever going to be able to hear what God might be trying to say to them about how to solve that problem right now. Well, see, the book of Colossians tells us that it says in Colossians, the first chapter, uh, down around about the 12, 13, 14 verse, it says, it says, uh, it talks about how that he has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance. That word meet that they use in the kingdom of, I mean, in the King James Version is the word qualified. We have been qualified. And it says that we have passed from the kingdom of darkness unto the kingdom of light. So when you know that you are qualified, the first thing that's going to happen inside you internally is you are going to enter into a way, into the really the kingdom realm where peace the peace of God is ruling in your heart. Now <clears throat> I want you to understand something. Even though we have been legally qualified through the Lord Jesus Christ and because we are in Him, He has received all of the inheritance, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Him. Since we're in Him, then we share in all of that inheritance with Him. So, so we're qualified because we're in Him. We're not qualified by our own qualifications. It's not by our own righteousness, which we have earned. It's because of the fact that we have believed the truth in the death, burial, and resurrection. We have believed that we are in Him. We believe He is who God says it. So, so we are abiding in this realm of peace. And so, and so in, in this, even though this has been taken care of, even, even though all the promises have been given to us, and even though the blood of Jesus has washed us and made us clean, we have to realize <clears throat> that there is still the times when our conscience can become defiled. Now, Everything, everything about the New Testament and everything about what Jesus gave us is understood through the Old Testament. Through all of the sacrifices, uh, all of the feasts, all of these rituals, they all were types and shadows that helped us understand what we have in Jesus. And uh, one of the reasons people dive off in so many crazy doctrines is, number the legalist reads the Old Testament and they actually don't see that Jesus made a covenant with God and that Jesus received the inheritance. And if we believe on him, we receive his righteousness. So, so they're going to they're go to legalism. Uh, 
But then there's going to be the person who either doesn't understand or doesn't read the Old Testament, who is going to read the New Testament, and they're just going to go, okay, so I'm in God. I'm the righteousness of God. So really, it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter how I live. And, and I don't ever have to deal with any sin. I don't ever have to deal with any failures in my life because, you know what? I'm the righteous of God. Peace of, peace of the Lord Jesus is mine. Da, 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 da. And they can quote a lot of scriptures, but it's not reality. It's really not working uh, in, their, in their lives. You know, uh, <clears throat> in the Old Testament, they, they had what was called a, a, a sin offering. And uh, the, in, in, in the sin offering, and Jesus, Jesus was, our, was our sin offering. Jesus paid the price for our sin, and His blood cleanses us from the root of sin, cleanses us from, from our sinful nature. Our spirit man is made alive to God. But there would be things that would happen uh, even after the Day of Atonement, that things would happen in your life, and really, some of them were not even sin. They were just things that negatively affected your conscience. And when something would negatively affect your conscience, you would bring a purification offering. And again, <clears throat> this wasn't necessarily because you had actually sinned. This was just because you, it, there's something you did that you didn't feel right about. And so you would, you would bring this purification offering. And, and that purification offering is a type of the blood of Jesus being applied to our conscience because the Bible tells us that the blood of Jesus cleanses our conscience. And, and that's not a one-time thing. Since your heart, since your conscience is part soul and part spirit, then your conscience can become defiled. And really the apostle John talked about this. When we fail to walk in love, our conscience becomes defiled and our heart condemns us. And we start losing confidence before God. We can't get our prayers answered because we are not in that place of peace. And we're not in that place where we feel qualified. We may intellectually know that we may have the right theology. <clears throat> but you see, a, script, a, a passage that people just debate about, 1 John 1, uh, 7 through about 9, actually 5 through about 9, kind of talks about this whole thing about confessing sin and this sort of thing. And people are like, I don't have to confess sin because the blood of Jesus has already cleansed me of my sin. Da, 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 da. Well, that's because they don't understand the difference between a sin offering and a purification offering. They don't understand that whenever, whenever our conscience is defiled, we need to come before the Lord. We need to come to Him and we need to resolve this thing and we need to come back to the place of peace. Now, when the Bible talks about these people who are in all this corruption and all of this, all of this discord, all of this, all of this destruction, it says that the problem is the way of peace they have not known. Well, I want to tell you something. You can be a person who believes on the blood of Jesus to cleanse you from your sin and then refuse to deal with the places where you violate your conscience. And you fall right into that category of a person who does not know the path of peace, does not understand how to stay in this, in this place of peace. And I'll tell you something, I've seen more people begin to build up hardness of heart because over the years they never dealt with anything. You know, confessing all the right scriptures all the time, but they never dealt with anything. Now listen, here's what we fail to understand. And remember, all the Old Testament is a type. And we don't understand the way of peace. We don't understand the process of salvation. We don't understand what we have in God if we don't get it from the scriptures. Otherwise, we're just making it up. We're just, we're just subjectively trying to figure it out. The ultimate goal of all of the sacrifices in the Old Testament always cul culminated in uh, reaching a place of peace and then ha having communion with God, reconnecting to God in a very intimate way. Now, when John wrote about the process of, of dealing with sin and denying sin and confessing sin and the blood of Jesus cleansing us from all sin. And, and that whole process, he was describing the way of peace based on the scriptures. And the ultimate goal there, I think it's in 1 John 1, 7, is where he talks about, about returning to this fellowship or this communion that we have with him. See, once we are at the place of peace, where we know, you know, nothing. Our, 
I, my conscience is not bothering me about anything. There's nothing in me that's distracting me, pulling me away. Once I reach that place, then I can reconnect to God on a very deep and intimate level. And in this place of peace, I can hear and I can recognize his voice. And I'm going to recognize and receive his instruction that's going to teach me how to walk out my healing, how to walk out these financial problems, how to have victory in every situation. Listen, God wants you to be an overcome, overcomer, someone who always overcomes the opposition, so someone who always overcomes the obstacles. He wants that to happen in every situation in your life, but he's the only one that can show you how to do that. But you've got to get to the place of peace where you can even hear and recognize his voice. You know, something people don't know is you have signals that constantly go from your heart to your brain. And you have way more signals that go from your heart to your brain than you do from your brain to your heart. And you see, when God speaks to you, He speaks to you in your heart. And then that emerges in your, in your mind, in your brain, so that you, you put it into words and you recognize and understand it. You know, there's people that hear their, live their whole life feeling like they're on the verge of something. I'm on the verge of something. I'm on the verge of something. You know what? That's usually the person that has the sense that God's speaking to them in their heart but they never do get the clear sense of what to do. I'll tell you what you do. You clear, you, you clear your conscience. You deal with any issues. You get past and deal with whatever you got to deal with. You get to that place of peace through the Lord Jesus Christ. And then once you're in peace, you wrap yourselves around God. Listen, this, this month I'm just talking about connecting to the life of God. This is not a particular series. Like I told you, this month you can get any series that you think will help you, any, any digital download of a book, any of my series, uh, other, than, other than heart physics, you can get anything that I've got for 20% off because I want you to get the tools you need to work through the situation that you've, that you've got to work with. So go to our website, impactministries.com. Man, get the tools you need at a great discount. Start tonight. You can start dealing with stuff tonight. But the ultimate goal of dealing with anything is always to come back to that place of peace. Always come back to that place where you're connecting to God personally. So he's speaking into your heart. So he's breathing his truth into your heart, his life and his power where that exchange takes place. Listen, in just a few minutes, we're going to be at the end of this broadcast. I want you to take 10 seconds at the end. I want you to be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel if you're watching this on YouTube or like it. If you're not watching on YouTube, you can go on YouTube and subscribe because we want everybody in the world to have a chance to hear these incredible messages. Also, I want to encourage you, if you haven't done it, download my free mobile app. Every single day I'm letting out words of encouragement. I'm sharing scriptures. I'm sharing insights that God's given me. I'm letting you know things that are happening. And, and I'm sharing my plans with you about how we're changing the way the world sees God, how we're going to reach a one billion people, raise up disciples around the world. So be sure and connect with us and we're going to help you connect with God.